everybody, and welcome to another 80s golden age of comedy. I am just thrilled to have the kinds of comedians, the quality of performers, the funny entertainers and stand-up comedians and producers and sitcom actors that are known throughout the 80s making the 80s in many people's minds, the golden age of comedy. I had some people bring up to me, well, what about the 60s when this happened and when that happened? And what about, you know what? I think for stand up comedy, I think there isn't anyone that would object to saying that the 80s were absolutely great, great years for stand up comedy and for stand ups. Everybody's careers. Uh, exploded, comedy clubs exploded all over the country, and for good reason, because people like my guest, comedians like my guest today, just knew how to rule the stage, knew how to entertain, knew what it took to be an entertainer, whether it was in front of, and I'm sure he'll share with you, 10 people or 10,000 people, that's what Dennis Blair did. Dennis performed in front of large crowds, opening up for incredible people. I'm not even going to go over the names now because he's going to tell you all about it. Dennis, welcome to the show. I'm so thrilled that you chose to come on the 80s golden age of comedy. Before you say anything, I think your name was brought up more than anyone when I said, hey, who, who, who should I call. Who should I get to be on the show? They brought up your name, and that's quite a compliment. Really? Well, usually my name gets talk, you know, brought up in terms of litigation, but, uh, <laughs> you know, so this is, a, this is a nice break for me. Thanks. Good, good, good to know. Good to know people remember who I am. That's great. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, we'd all be surprised. You know, I said, you know, when I talked, there, there was like the first 15, 18 shows I did were with people that I knew personally, people that mm -hmm. I represented in case you don't know, and you might not even know, I was a personal appearance agent during the 80s. Mm -hmm. We didn't know each other that much because for two reasons. One, I spent a lot of my time down in the improv, mm -hmm. and you were mostly a comedy store guy. No, and no, I was, I was, I was an improv guy. I, I did the comedy store a few times, but, you know, as you remember, you, couldn't, you either had to choose. You had to choose one or the other. So I guess our paths just never, you know, we were there on different nights maybe. And, and, and I know that instead of having to rely on the improv, like a lot of the comics, you were drafted, man. You uh, were taken by some of the great talents in our business, and they took you along, and you became opening act to a lot of great people. But before we go into that, I want to start from the beginning. You know, even where you were from, what kind of family you were brought up, up in, and did any of that have to do with why you went into this crazy world of comedy? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I would have to say, well, first of all, I was born and raised in New York City, New York boy. I don't know if that's the same as you. Did you, were you are you in New York? I was boy? born in the Bronx and grew up in Westchester. I was born in the, I was born in the Bronx. We grew up, grew up in Whitestone, Queens. So oh, okay. we have a thing. We have a connection there. Yeah, already connected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, and I was, I would have to say I was a, strange child you know not horribly strange but you know I, I mean i i did i was always like i was always kind of like artistic i would i would draw and and write my own comic books starting when i was like eight nine years old you know that kind of deal and uh and my parents were my dad was typical 50s kind of quiet dad you know didn't didn't get too involved in raising me or anything like that he was a great guy though but my mom was the one who you know <laughs> my mom was just kind of loony she was out there you know uh overprotective to a fault you know so i i was a little stifled when i was a kid um but um but my main my the the, the way i got started i started you know music music was my thing i mean i saw the beatles on it sullivan I wanted to be a saxophone player when i was a uh, 10 10 years old i said to my mom can i have saxophone lessons and she said sure so she found a place that had only accordion lessons i don't know how saxophone got transmogrified into accordion <laughs> I spent two years being an accordion player, taking lessons on accordion, uh, developed my ear, 
it was a good good for that, but it wasn't good for attracting females. No, no, the saxophone is much better. That would have done. That would have been it. And then all of so I, here I am stuck in accordion hell, and then I watched the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, and that was it for me. Guitar, uh, joining bands, uh, trying to get put bands together, started writing songs. Um, so that's that's how I kind of started uh, creatively. You know, I, comedy was. I was kind of a funny kid. My brother and I. Um, got along really well and he was funny and I was funny too. Uh, and we just sort of made each other laugh an awful lot, you know, uh, but, um, but no comedy uh, on the horizon until, you know, much later when it just kind of fell into my lap. And how did it fall into your lap? So um, here's what happened. Uh, I, I was starting to play guitar in bands and on my, um, on my own. And I, uh, I, I met this, this girl named Peggy. She was a waitress at uh, a place called Fern's Harness Shop in Roslyn. I, I and, like the uh, story already, by the way. So I'm, you know, if I'm playing all these bar gigs and uh, when I wasn't in a band, which was often, I would just do solo gigs, playing cover songs, James Taylor, Paul Simon, you know, that kind of thing. You know how it is in bar gigs, you, the guitar player's up there, no one's really listening to you. Um, so I, I got really uh, pissed off one day and I got like, well, my panties up in a bunch. And I said, they're not listening to me. They're just talking and they're drinking wine and they're not listening to my, my dulcet tones. So I go upstairs during a break and, I, and, I, and the big song uh, that year was Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. And I just, did, just put together a parody called Singing Too High. I come back down after a break. I start doing my set, James Taylor, Paul Simon, then I do this. And now the Bee Gees, and, and you know, people hated disco in those days. So they, eh, boo, eh, it's dead, that sucks. And I start doing the comedy, I start doing the parody version and people actually started listening. I heard a couple of chuckles, then I heard a couple of laughs and I'm going, hmm, people are paying attention now. So then I, I did a parody, I went up, I, I, I wrote some more parodies of more songs and uh, people started laughing at those. And then they started yelling out, do, uh, do this guy or do Neil Young or do Bob Dylan. And I would try to come up with a parody on the spot. Uh, and, they would, and then I would develop patter in between those parodies. So it became, after a couple of uh, weeks, Kind of a little comedy act that I had, and it was uh, gaining a lot of traction. And right around that time, my wife and I, my my girlfriend at the time, Peggy, moved into Manhattan, four blocks away from Dangerfields. Someone told me they had an audition night at Dangerfields on Sundays. Uh, I said, "This is something I should try." Uh, I went down there. I got on at one o'clock in the morning with David Copperfield as the MC. Do you remember wow. David? Cop yeah. Wow. Not the fictional character, the British guy. Um, and, um, and he put me on, and for some reason it went really great. You know, the audience was, you know, they'd seen so many jugglers, I guess, and mimes or whoever was up that night, and they were kind of tired and bored, and I came up with my par little parody act and uh, scored right away, and they hired me to become the opening act for whoever the headline would be right on the spot. So that's how it all got started, just an accident kind of fell wow. into it. So, so, so the one thing I want to go backwards on a little bit is I love, because I know how hard it is for comedians to meet someone, to find someone, to, to marry. I mean, you know, half, half the guys are alone all the time and nothing comes of their relationships. And then every once in a while, I hear a story about someone who, who's married, gets married, stays married. How did you meet Peggy? Well, Peggy was a waitress at Fern's Harness Shop, which is one of those bars that I play. And we just, yep. uh, and we just um, started kind of like not dating exactly. We were both dating different people at the time. But I remember we were at two different tables with our other dates. And we would just make each other laugh. And the other, the other, the other two would be, what, what's, what are they doing? What, <laughs> they're making each other. How come, I'm, how come he's not talking to me? How come she's not talking to me? So, you know, we had a connection from the beginning. She was a waitress there at, at Burns Harness Shop. Uh, and, you know, she started really liking what I did and loved hearing me sing, actually, straight songs, but also liked the comedy. And if people were talking when I was on stage, she would come to them and say, here's your, here's your sangria and your cheese. Shut the fuck up. The guy's <laughs> singing. We listen to him. So, you know, so we had that going for us. Uh, so that's how we met, you know, and we just started hanging out. And uh, we moved into the city together, into Manhattan together. After, and uh, in, the, in the early 80s and we just she said to me one day it was this is what I say a very romantic proposal very romantic uh, she turned to me one day after we'd been just dating for and living together for two years and she said 
I think we should either get married or start seeing other people. Most romantic uh, proposal I've ever heard of in my life. And I said, uh, I got no one else to, let's just get married. So uh, that's what we did. Uh, so that's how I met her. That's the story of Peg. And how long have you been married? Well, it's going to be 40 years in uh, this September. Ooh. Yeah, and I don't even like her. It's frightening. <laughs> you know, it's, I've never even, I've never even talked to her. I don't understand how we stayed together this long, but you know, it seemed to work out perfectly. So 40 years, yeah, 40 years. So here you are, end up just blocks away from danger fields. And the first time you go up, you did pretty well. What were you, what were you saying to yourself when you did pretty well that first night? Well, you know, it's so weird uh, how things happen like that, that you can't, couldn't plan in a million years. I mean, I was going to be a singer songwriter. That was my plan. I wasn't planning on doing comedy, but that just happened the way it, uh, the way I explained it. So when I went up there and, and it went really well, first of all, the, the first thing was, wow, I really like this reaction. I like making people laugh. People are paying attention. They're like waiting for, you know, what I have to say. So that's the, the coolest part of it. And the second thing was, geez, I, I wonder if I could actually do something with this. You know, uh, the, the, this, I wonder if this is like a career path or something like that. I mean, I don't know if I came to it that precisely, but I know in the back of my mind, it was going, hmm. And then, you know, what, the, what happened immediately was after that show that night at Dangerfields, uh, the, the management came up to me and said, hey, uh, you know, like I said, you want to be the house opening act? And I went, yeah, let's see how far this train runs. And the next, uh, the, the headliner the, the following week, who was the first person I ever opened for was Jackie Mason. And, oh. uh, and he, was the, he was there for the whole week and we got along great. He, he, he really liked what I did. And then, and then during the Jackie Mason run, who walks in on a Friday night but Rodney Dangerfield himself. Wow. And uh, he, 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 he pokes his head in, he sees me, never saw me before, he hears the audience laughing and i come off stage and he goes hey they obviously like what you do what do you do <laughs> and he had missed my he had missed my whole act but he heard the laughing so i told him what i did i do parodies and i do i'm like kind of a goofy guy on stage and he said oh i'm gonna watch you and he watched the second show and we became friendly so that's you know all this stuff started falling into place magically and i never would have you know a month earlier or a week earlier i would never consider that I would be at Dangerfields and like Rodney Dangerfield, who was about to become the biggest comic in America, had befriended me because he just liked me and he liked my show. So it just happened really quickly. And that's what happened. I said, I'm going to do this. You know, I put the music aside for a while, maybe. Great. I'd love to hear a little bit more about Jackie. I mean, I got to know him a little bit out at the improv. I'd love to hear your memories, uh, interesting mm -hmm. things that happened with you and, and Jackie and what you're, what you thought of Jackie? Well, uh, first of all, I always thought he was funny. I mean, I, again, uh, I, I, I wasn't a comedian when I was growing up, but I loved comics. You know, I'd always watch Shelley Berman or Bob Newhart or, uh, or Kel Cosby and Jackie Mason on the Ed Sullivan show. So, I mean, I love to laugh and I thought these guys were terrific, but I never had any uh, thoughts that I would ever meet them. So, you know, opening for him for the first time was like, well, this is great. I love this guy. You know, he's hilarious. He's at, and he's out of his mind. You know, he would come down off stage, you know, like on a Monday night at Dangerfields, Jackie Mason would be there and they'd be maybe, I don't know, 50 people in the audience, you know, because it's Monday and a lot of people, I guess, didn't remember him from the Ed Sullivan show. And he was really a big star. Uh, plus, he had that thing with Ed Sullivan where he got himself in a lot of trouble. Uh, so he, he would just like be, and he, and he would just come down off the stage and go, they tell me there's only 50 people here, but I, I bet you there's more. I bet you there's more. I'm going to come down. I'm going to count each one of you individually. I'm going to point to you about one, two, three, four. Okay, I guess they were right. I thought they were going to cheat me those no, no good sons of the best. It's just like just watching him just go off was great, you know. Uh, so the first night I, um, I opened for him, and it went well, thank God. And he did his show. And then I, um, he comes up to me at the bar, and he goes, Oh, you're the person that opened for me? I said, yeah, yeah. He says, you, you're very funny for a Gentile. <laughs> and then he turned, he turned to his friend 
Jesse said, you see this kid, he was pretty funny. I mean, he, one clever thing after another that, that, that you don't get very like, much of that these days, you know, all the stuff that's not, and it, it, it make, makes, makes, makes it very funny. So, you know, so now we uh, forged a friendship and we started, I would, I would have lunch with him every once in a while. And to this day, I, I went into Manhattan a year and a half ago to do um, the Borgata Hotel and, and I called him up and his manager, Jill, and we had lunch and I still oh. see him never. Cause there's no, you're always gonna come away with a story about Jackie Mason, you know. Um, and, you know, he's gonna always say something that I have to remember that right that, uh, you know. You, so that, that's the beginning of my friendship with him. You, you did a great, you do a great impersonation. I mean, that's, that's really nice. I like that a lot. <laughs> This is one of the good impersonations I do. I don't understand how I can do it. Sometimes you can't do it, but the guy keeps talking and he just doesn't stop. And then he does the thing with his hand where he does this, he goes like that with his thumb, and this, and, that, and that's it. And you're an idiot, you're a putz for saying a thing like that. And get out of my way. Yeah. <laughs> and then he did his movie, which, you know, I saw about a year ago. I, I enjoyed it. You mean The Jerk? No, the, the, the movie that he wrote and produced for himself. Was it the jerk? No. No, he didn't write. I didn't know. I didn't know he did a movie. <laughs> it's been a while. I guess I haven't spoken to him in a while. Yeah, he he did a movie about. Uh, uh, it was a takeoff on Twelve Angry Men. Okay, all right. I think I did hear about him doing it, but I never actually saw it. How was it? Was it, it good? It was good. It was good. Okay. I mean, I don't know if all the Gentiles would like it, but <laughs> I, I really Goodness. liked it. The Gentiles don't understand my brand of humor. I would ask him, I would ask him, I'd say, he went, he, he come, he came to Vegas once and I don't think, yeah, I don't, I don't think it was his crowd and we're having lunch and I go, how did Vegas go? He goes, I, I'm not going to do it again. He says, I don't think a guy in a cowboy hat was to come see a Jew talk for an hour and a half. Yeah. So, you know, these are, the, these are the kind of things he said all, just off the top of his head. But I'll tell you, uh, when I was living in Florida, this had to be, I don't know, let's just say 20 years ago or 15 years ago. And right. I went to see him at one of the hotels and it was packed. And mm -hmm. I, I thought that they were going to take people out in ambulances because they couldn't stop laughing and they couldn't right. catch their breath. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, the Broadway shows, they were amazing. And uh, oh. and apparently he's a huge star in England. You know, I mean, he he, he would do like three weeks a, a year in, in England. They, they, they loved him there. And, you know, I'm. And I go, Your, the humor translates? He goes, yeah, they understand American politics. They understand all the things I'm talking about. For some reason, I don't understand why, but I'm a big hit. So I keep going back because the check clears. You know, I mean, it's stuff like that. So yeah, he's he's an international star. Uh, I, I don't think there'll ever be a greater, like pure stand-up comedian. You know, Robin was Robin and Andy and mm -hmm. all those people. But I don't right. know if there'll ever be a greater bullet 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 stand-up comedian yeah. than jackie oh yeah yeah he could make me double over laughing him and victor borga i remember watching as a kid and going oh my god this is the funniest guy i've ever seen i mean that kind of like deep belly laugh you know you just fall off your chair yeah he doesn't work much anymore but still every once in a while he'll do a corporate gig i think but i haven't seen him in a year and a half i hope he's well yeah yeah so so let's go to the next step you know you you were at the, you, you did well. And what happened after that? Uh, when you started getting a little more attention? Well, um, I'm doing Danger Fields. This was like 1980. Um, and I'm, uh, now I'm starting to open for Rodney. So, you know, and that, that worked out well because Rodney liked me, liked my show. So I would be, I would be opening for him uh, among other people. But then all of a sudden Caddyshack came out right around that time. And he becomes this giant, this sensation, this gigantic, unbelievable, like like the top comic in America almost. And it used to be, you know, I mean, he, his crowds at Dangerfields used to be, you know, on, on a weekday, they'd be maybe 50, 60 people. And on the weekdays, you know, 100, 120. Now uh, people couldn't get in, you know, I mean, there's lines around the block, you know, so now he has to do theaters. He has, he, he has to do, you know, 3,000 seat theaters and 1500 seat theaters and uh, he brings me along with him so I'm doing comedy for a month maybe a month and a half and now all of a sudden I'm opening for Rodney Dangerfield at Westbury Music Fair <laughs> places like that you know I mean here I, I mean like I said you couldn't have written this. If, this if this was a movie people wouldn't believe the plot you know so and you know and and um it went well although you know opening for Rodney was 
uh, interesting because, uh, you know, the lights go down and people think the star is going to come out and they announce, and now please, here's, here's Rodney's special guest, Dennis Blair. And you, go, what? And you just hear the audience just kind of deflate and you know, people going, boo, get off, where's Rodney? You know, so you have to be funny really fast. But luckily, since I opened with the Bee Gees parody and it was musical, uh, it got people pretty quickly. So I, I was lucky in that in that way. And as, and we, we started uh, traveling the country for three and a half years. We traveled the country. Uh, and then I'd come back and I'd do Danger Fields and I would open for different people there. If Rodney wasn't doing it, I remember opening for, one of my favorite stories is I was opening for Sarah Vaughn, Danger Fields. Wow. And uh, before I went on, some waiter comes over and he goes, don't get nervous, but Paul Newman's in the audience. I go, oh, thanks. Thanks for telling me that right before I go on. So um, anyway, I go on and I know now I know Paul Newman's in the audience. And again, luckily, one of those nights where the show went really well, I come off stage. That same waiter is running after. He says, he comes up to me, he says, uh, slow down. Paul Newman's running after you. I go, watch Paul Newman's what? He's running after me. Paul Newman comes up to me, looks at me with those like blue eyes. And I almost married him on the spot. He goes, hi, I'm Paul Newman. And I, part of me is going, oh, hi, trying to stay calm. And the other part of me is going, I'm talking to Paul Newman right now. And he's, and he's going, so that was a great show. How do you do that? Do you, uh, do you do the same show every night? Do you change it up a little bit? Uh, how do you write your jokes? And, and, I'm, and I'm trying to, now I'm being interrogated by Paul Newman. I'm trying to just remain calm and not be an idiot. Like, hi, Paul, how are you doing? How's everything? I'm going, well, it's kind of like being an actor, I guess, Paul. You know, I mean, you pretty much have your, your standards set. But uh, every once in a while, you can, you know, you can improvise and stuff like that. And he's questioning me for like two minutes. And, he follow, and I'm going downstairs to the dressing room. And he's following me downstairs, asking wow. me more. And after that, he goes, finally, after two minutes, he goes, well, great show. And he, and he goes away. And, and, and I just, I couldn't believe it. People are coming up to me going, you just had a two minute conversation with like one of the biggest actors in America. I said, I, I know I can't, I can't, um, I can't fathom what's happening to me in my life. It's very strange. So that's what happened. Opening for uh, Sarah Vaughan, opening for uh, different people. Uh, Larry Storch, I remember, uh, the unknown comic. He was, he was the biggest thing in comedy at the time and I opened for him. So it was Danger Fields and then On the Road with Rodney. Danger Fields, On the Road with Rodney. That was the, that was the early years of my career. And it was great because Three thousand people with three thousand people laughing—it's uh, it's quite a thrill, you know. You know, I think most people would have a super tough time imagining what it would be like to step out on a stage in front of three thousand people, and they're only looking at you, and you have right. a job to do. That you know, we all know about the flop sweat. You know, I right. So, we all know about those stories. What was it like for you the first time that you had to go out in front of thousands instead of hundreds? Well, the first time I remember very clearly, it was in Philadelphia, it was the Academy of Music, and I was opening for Rodney. And you know, the first time I'd ever done anything like like that at all, opening for on a on a stage in front of three thousand people or whatever it was, lights go down. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready to see Rodney Dangerfield? Yeah! All right, we have an opening act. What? Boo! You know, I'm going, now it's the first time I've done this. I'm going, oh, what do I do? And I go out, before I got to this, the microphone, they were booing me. I hadn't even done anything yet. And so I had to think fast. And for some reason, I got this, the, 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 Phil, the Phillies had just won, won the World Series. So to win them over immediately, I say, hey, is this the uh, home of the world famous World Series champions? Yay! Oh, from boo to yay immediately. And I, I just did some some go some joke like, you know, yes, I love the Phillies. They always come from behind or something like that. And the audience <laughs> laughed and they thought it was hilarious. So luckily that night I got them immediately. And then I launched right into my disco, you know, my Bee Gees thing, and then they were on my side. But that first couple of that first minute or so was like, what am I gonna do? They hate me. They want to see Rodney. So that was that. That's a very distinct memory. Just going, thank God. I don't know where that idea came from, but thank God it hit me at the right time, the right spot. And especially, I mean, you're looking out in the audience, and you're looking into the eyes. You know, six thousand eyes looking at you. Um, right. Right. How, yeah. How 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 did how does you, how do you wrap your head around that? 
Um, you know, it's just it, one of those things where, I don't know, something kicked in that, that first time where I did a big theater where I just, a, after that first uh, joke I kind of came, kind of came up with where they, they kind of were on my side, then it became um, fun. Then it became, oh, okay, I can do this. And they seem to like me, even though I'm in the way of them seeing Rodney right away. Um, and, and then it became just like this, oh, this is, oh. Man, this is like, you know, I mean, you hear that many laughs at one time. It's just amazing. And, you know, if it had, if it had gone badly, it would have been exactly the opposite. But, uh, you know, I remember after I did 25 minutes or whatever it was, and I came off to a, like a, a like cheers and, ah, and, you know, no feeling like that in the world. I mean, and I love doing clubs still, you know, but like 3,000 seats, you know, 3,000 people going, yeah, yeah, this guy was good, you know. Um, that's that's how you wrap your head around it. Then it becomes like a drug, I guess. I know that's a cliche, and then you just say, "Let's do more of these," you know. <laughs> See if I can, you know. Then then uh, and then, and then some of the fear goes away too, because you know you get through that first one, and then like the next one, okay, I survived that. Now I think I can do this. Um, so that and and you know, ninety five percent of the time the shows went well. There was always there were always those occasional shows that were kind of iffy, but I I never got booed off the stage. I'm proud of that. I, even if I didn't do great, I never got booed off. How exciting is that to be able to work with, you know, Rodney, especially when he's uh, at the uh, the pinnacle of, of his career. I kind of had a similar experience where uh, one of my clients was Howie Mandel when he was working on St. Elsewhere. And mm -hmm. uh, he uh, went on Carson. Uh, every uh, every few weeks, because they found out that every time he went on Carson, the ratings went up a point for saying elsewhere. Hmm. And then he got to promote the the, the gigs that I was uh, getting for him. So it was it was really nice to see how he take off, you know, right in front right. of my eyes. So you mm -hmm. had sim similar experiences. So what happened after that? I mean, it, you know, in a way, it's fantastic to be opening for somebody like Rodney, and and in a way. It, it, it can be not stifling by any means, but uh, there might be a time when you say, uh, "What else is next?" Right. Well, I, at this point, I was I was just kind of along for the ride. I didn't have any great plans. I, I've never been much of a planner to begin with. So I, at that point, I was going, "Yeah, let's see what this goes." And you know what happened was, you know, he came up he came up to me one day in his dressing room, and said, "Hey, they want to do a movie starring me. If you come up with an idea for a movie, let me know." And I said, Ooh. "Are you kidding me? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go home and come up with an idea." And I came up with the idea for Easy Money, uh, which which he did, and he made me a writer on that film. And um, I never actually got story by credit, but that's okay. We're gonna, that's one of those things where we're gonna let that go. Um, but yeah, so it was a co-writer of Easy Money, and then I did two of his TV specials, and so you know, then through that, I was kind of like getting known. On, I, I was booking comedy clubs on my own, headlining, so that that came out of that. So that wasn't too bad. Um, but what happened next was um, someone at Caesars in Vegas told uh, the Joan Rivers people about me. Hey, you should see this guy. He opens for Rodney. He's really funny. And uh, I got a call from Bill Samoth, who was Joan's manager at the time, said, I hear you're a funny mm -hmm. guy. You want to work with Joan for 10 days? Now, here's the thing. Rodney hated Joan Rivers because he claimed that she stole his jokes, which she did not. Uh, but, he, you know, Rodney had this thing in his, his personality where if he got something in his head, it was, it was hard to get it, get it to realize that he could be wrong. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, I kind of told Rodney, yeah, Joan Rivers people, they came to me and they want me to do 10 nights with her. And I, I told them no. And Rodney said, no, you should do it. I go, what? He goes, no, you should do it. Because she, 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 at the time, she was a, a substitute host on The Tonight Show. And uh, he said, yeah, she'll put you on The Tonight Show, maybe. And no, you go ahead. Uh, it's okay. I said, but you hate her. That's all right. Uh, just do it. So I signed a contract for the 10-night gig. Two days later, Rodney goes, you know, I thought about it. I don't want you to do it. Ugh. I'm going, well, you told I signed a contract. You told me to do it. Yeah, but I don't like her, you know. So... Now, all of a sudden, I'm in trouble with Rodney, even though he told me to do it. I wound up doing it with Joan, 10 nights with Joan and Gary Shandling. 
Uh, she always used two opening acts for some reason. I never quite understood why. So we had a great time. It went really well with her. They wanted to use me again. Uh, Rodney was mad at me now. Um, and uh, there was another incident at his house in Westport where I, <laughs> he, he accused me of bringing my dog swimming in his pool. We brought our dog with us and, he, and our dog fell in the jacuzzi and he accused us of bringing the dog swimming in his indoor pool. So that and the Joan Rivers thing, eventually on New Year's Eve, I believe it was 1983, Rodney at the, um, at the, uh, oh, the Sunrise Theater in, in Fort Lauderdale, right before I went on, Rodney fired me. He said, yeah, well, we should part ways. We shouldn't do this anymore. So I had to go on and do a show after having just been fired from Rodney Dangerfield. So that was a trauma. Um, but luckily, I hooked up with Joan after that, Joan Rivers. And she did put me on The Tonight Show eventually. He fought well, for me. I've had a couple of the guys tell me about that. Like the first time they did The Tonight Show and what it was like to stand behind those curtains. Can you share a little right. bit of that with me? Yeah, and especially for someone like me, because, you know, uh, guitar comics, you know, guys like me who were musical comics, they didn't really, they weren't Johnny's cup of tea, you know. And Jim McCauley, who was the booker, uh, saw me at the comedy store. I was, uh, Rod, Rodney put me in the comedy store to audition for Jim McCauley, who was the talent coordinator at The Tonight Show at the time. And he came up to me and said, well, you are very funny, but we can't do parodies on, on, on The Tonight Show. So I didn't know what I was gonna do about that. But then I started coming up with some public domain songs that I could make funny. So that seemed to work. Uh, Joan fought for me and said, listen, he's funny. He's not gonna do his parodies. He'll do something else. He'll do the things that he can't get in trouble for. Uh, so they finally relented in 1984 and uh, I got up to do The Tonight Show. And yes, um, standing behind the curtain, you know, it wasn't Johnny, it was Joan as the host that night, but still standing behind the curtain going, I can't believe I'm doing this. I was strangely not nervous, I don't know why, except my mouth dried up halfway through my set and I could tell, oh, something's working subconsciously. Cause you know, you're, you're there and it's, it's, it's 500 people in the studio, but you know, like 10 million people are gonna watch it later. And uh, I remember uh, I went over to the uh, couch and uh, she said, that was great, Dennis. We can't talk because uh, you, you, they, they were laughing so hard you went so long. So uh, we'll, we'll just go to commercial and that was great, you know? And uh, they had me on again. I did it twice. Um, and I was gonna do it the third time with Johnny. And then Johnny and Joan had their big falling out. So that was it for me because I was considered a Joan act. Right. So I was just right. about to get the third shot with Johnny and it didn't work out, but I got to do it twice. And uh, I remember that night after doing the first show, uh, I was so like, in, I was like, I couldn't, you know, my, my brain was just in a different place. I couldn't believe I just did the Tonight Show. And I don't remember, I got in my car after the show and I don't remember how I got home. I drove home somehow, but it was like, my brain was just addled. It was like, I just did the Tonight Show. And then all of a sudden I'm at my front door. So the yeah, it was, it was an amazing, amazing the experience. The was just mm -hmm. cooking so much, huh? Yeah, 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 exactly. So that was the Tonight Show experience. And then I was with Joan for two years and Gary Shandling. Wow. So did anything change for you after that first, Joan? You know, I started becoming, I, well, I got an agent, Fred Suss. I don't know if you remember. Well, Lee Solomon. I bet you, you remember Lee Solomon. Um, so, you know, <laughs> all these, when I started working with Rodney, all these agents all of a sudden wanted to sign me, you know? They said, hey, this kid, you know, we can get him, we can get him work. I asked Rodney, Rodney, they want me to, they want to sign me at, at William Morris. What do you think? And I'm all starry eyed going, I'm going to get an agent, you know? And he says, this is what they'll do. William Morris, this is what they'll do. You know the money you're making with me? They'll take 10%. That's what they'll do. <laughs> he wasn't too keen on agents. Wow. But, but I did sign with um, Lee Solomon, who got me a whole bunch of work. He was like this typical cufflinks and, you know, he was, dressed 10 times better than any of his performers. And he like held court, you know, he was a real character. But after him, I got Fred Suss, who was a really good agent because I would get calls all the time. Hey, you want to open for so-and-so? You want to open for Beach Boys? Hey, you want to open for uh, Laura Brannigan? Hey, you want to open for the Righteous Brothers? He'd get me all this work. So I was working all the time wow. and I kind of enjoyed it. You know, I didn't mind that I wasn't 
you know, a lot of comics in those days wanted to get their own sitcom. And I just kind of enjoyed what I was doing. I like doing stand up and, you know, at, at clubs also, but also opening for these people and, and having people laugh. And then after 30 minutes, you're done. You know, you don't have to hang out. You're just, you're, you, you show up, you do your show, 30 minutes, 25 minutes, whatever, and, and you're done and, and people laugh and you feel good. So I was fine. I didn't have a lot of, I mean, I would have loved to have been gone up for a sitcom or for movies. I did write a couple of movies which got sold but didn't get made. Um, but you know, I, I just really enjoyed the whole on the road thing and opening for stars. Wow! And then you, you know, you worked with one of the guys that's uh, on the the mind of every comic and and uh, George Carlin. I mean. Tell me about your experience with George, because uh, everybody loved George, and we all know his time on this planet was cut way too short. Tell me what you tell me what it was like to work with George, who George was off the stage, uh, you know, whatever you could kind of remember. Any interesting stories that you can share? Well, here's what happened with George. You know, this guy Fred Suss, who was my agent, he kept you know, you know, after Rodney, after Joan, he just kept booking me with different people, and he called up one day and said, "Hey." would you like to uh, open for George Carlin for three months? And I believe I was packing my bag before the phone call ended. Um, I said, yes, that would be amazing. Uh, I don't, I think they saw a tape of me or a video of me maybe on the Tonight Show or one of my, or the other shows that I did comedy, comic strip live, uh, you know, live at the improv, those kind of shows. Anyway, they, they decided to try me for three months. So I remember going to, the theater in Omaha, never met George, um, pacing in my dressing room, really nervous because he, you know, like you said, he was, oh my God, I'm gonna open for George Carlin. He's like the best, he's incredible. There's no one better. Richard, he's right up there with Richard Pryor, Lenny Bruce, all of those guys. But you know, some of his comedy came across as kind of angry on stage and I'm going, I hope he's not an angry guy. I hope he's not, you know, one of these jerks, you know, that you admire on TV. So I'm, I'm, I'm pacing in my dressing room and I hear upstairs the door of the theater open and I hear George's voice going, hey, Dennis, where the fuck are you? And I'm going, oh, <laughs> I go, I'm down here, George. And he's going, hey, I'm George. You know, I, I know, you know, it's like the Paul Newman incident. And he goes, yeah, what are those? Uh, was that a deli tray? I'm taking all your cold cuts and I'm taking 50 carrots. And he's going around and he's being like real goofy and he's being real funny. And then he goes, all right, we're going to be watching you. So, so don't fuck up, you prick. And then he goes out and I go, and I go, hmm, that worked out okay. He doesn't seem to be an idiot and an asshole. Um, so I'm going, okay, he calmed me down. Uh, he seems real friendly and he's glad to see me. Then I go out and do the show. And again, you know, you have in the back of your mind, I hope this goes well, but you can't, you can't just go out there with like a defeatist attitude. You got to go, this is going to go great. This is going to be good. And luckily it went really well. And um, George said, oh, this is going to, he came, he came backstage and said, oh, this, that was great. This is going to work out, you know? And then I watched his show and I felt pretty good about my show that night because it went really well. But then I watched George and he's got like, an hour and a, and a half of, oh, of stuff wow. that I've never heard before. Wow. And I'm going, oh, that's how you do it. <laughs> I see, that's the way to become great. Okay, I'll never get there, but uh, yeah, he's just, he's just amazing and just so funny and all his stuff was just so incredible, the, the writing and the performing too. Um, he's, he's a great, he was a great performer as well, as we all know. And then after three months, he said, hey, um, you wanna just stay? And I said, I got nothing else to do, you know? So, so we're just, uh, three months became 18 years, you know? And uh, it was, um, and the good thing about George was, you know, with Rodney, I was with Rodney for three and a half years and Rodney was great. He took me under his wing and, and I wouldn't be anywhere without Rodney. But he demanded a lot of your time. He wanted to hang out all the time. And what happens with some, some people who are stars is if you do one thing that they consider wrong, it can go south for you. So I think that's what eventually happened. The incident with Joan and the incident with my dog. And then, you know, so, so with George, we would hang out, you know, on, backstage, you know, in the dressing room and we just make each other laugh. And he was just goofy. He's got this, he had this goofy persona backstage. You know, he'd go on stage sometimes and he'd be angry and he'd be, these people suck and everything sucks in this country and all that stuff. And then you go backstage and you go, hey, Dennis, look, look at this Band-Aid, you know? 
Um, <laughs> he just do these this, this go these goofy things, and um, but then when you uh, were not uh, in a in a working situation, he was a recluse. You know, he was in his room writing. Uh, you wouldn't see him, so it was perfect. You know, so you'd spend some time with him, but not constantly spend time with him. So you couldn't get in trouble as easily as you could with some of these other people. That's, I think, part of the reason I lasted 18 years, you know, uh, because, you know, we had just a nice, distant, but friendly relationship. Opposite of, uh, of Rodney, where Rodney needed people around him and needed his buds around him. And, and George was completely opposite. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Rodney, I could see Rodney like, you know, Rodney would call me up, hey, come on over to the house. You know, he lived in Westport. And I lived in Fort Jefferson, so I'd have to take a ferry. But he'd go, hey, come over to the house. If I were to say to him, yeah, Rodney, my uh, my grandmother just died. Oh, OK, come on over to the house. You write some comedy. <laughs> and you couldn't say no because I'm working with him, you know, and I don't want to offend him. So, uh, yeah, but George was just the opposite, you know. Uh, he, he, he wasn't, like, really a social animal. He was totally, as a matter of fact, after each show, he didn't want to really do like the thing where have people come back and hang out in the dressing room. He wanted to do what was called the Zippo Bango. The Zippo Bango was five minutes before George's show would end, I would be in the rental car because we would we would stay at hotels near wherever he was playing or you know in the city where he was playing and he would rent cars to get to the gigs. So I would start up the car, I would be behind the wheel, he would run off stage directly into my car and say things like, all right, all right, Dennis, gun that thing. Run over some of these assholes if you have to. We want to get out of here. And he just zip out, you know? So he didn't even want to hang out with people backstage. Not that he didn't like people. He liked them individually. But if he could avoid, you know, one-on-one -on -one contact when it was unnecessary, he, he would do that, you know? But, but in airports, like, you know, people would come up to him, George, how you doing? He would just say hi and not be condescending at all. Uh, you say, how you doing? We saw your special. Oh, I hope you liked it. You know, that kind of thing. He was just a real friendly, outgoing, approachable guy, you know, um, which was which was the great thing about him. And we had a lot of laughs, you know, on those uh, dressing room uh, hangs. And, you know, when we'd be in the rental car together, we had great, great, these horrifying contests we'd come up with where we just couldn't stop laughing. What a great way to spend 18 years, huh? Yeah, that's why that's why it never bothered me. Oh, you know, what do you this is all you're doing? Yeah, but it's, you know, he paid first of all, it paid well. It was, it was a really good living, you know. And uh Yeah, I, I I did easy money. I did the movie, I did some TV, I did the tonight show. You know, I didn't I was totally happy in my role as the second banana. It was, it was really good because the people I got to hang out with were amazing. And you and you never had to worry about drawing. You know, it's like they, they had to worry about how many people are showing up, how many tickets sold. Me, I just show up, do my 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 little sketch, and then I go go back to the hotel. It was perfect. I know 2020 is a throwaway. What about the yeah. last few years before that? How was that for you? Uh, well, let's see. Well, well, George died in 2008. Uh, that was the last long term. Um, Oh, you know what? my agents and stuff. Tell me about that. What did he get sick? Did he have a heart attack? What was your memory of what happened? Around um, 2005, all of a sudden, George started canceling shows. And, uh, you know, the manager would call up and you go, Yeah, we're not doing this weekend. Uh, and they're going, What's going on? Ah, George doesn't feel well. Okay. Um, then he canceled a whole like month's worth of shows and they said, we found out that he was going into rehab and what happened eventually was um he had he had battled he, he had battled an addiction to vicodin and red wine for 20 years and we didn't know about it but he was able to he was able to deal with it uh most of that time but also now the last two years of his life all of a sudden you know he'd had heart problems before he'd had three heart attacks before but was healthy and had gotten stints and everything was fine. And then the last two years, his, his, his arteries started calcifying and he was getting really sick. And he was backstage, he was, was kind of grumpy. He was never grumpy before. He loved, he loved going on the road and doing his shows. He loved writing and coming up with new stuff to do HBO shows every two or three years. So uh, all of a sudden he got grumpy and he didn't want to talk to anybody. He'd close his door and 
good, wasn't joking around with me even anymore. And we were going, what's wrong with George? And we found out he was, he was suffering physically. Um, and then, you know, um, he, he, he started canceling more shows. And so what happened with me is I started, I had to start booking more clubs. I started doing cruise ships, um, that kind of thing, you know. Um, and then, then when he died, it was, and, and my friend my, and my agent, Fred Suss had uh, stopped being an agent. So I didn't even have that pipeline to go to. So it was kind of, you know, it was after George died, it was, uh, it was, it was kind of a, a, a fall off of, you know, my, my comedy career, but I was still doing the clubs and I was doing the cruise ships and that was, that was going okay. And, uh, and I was doing the clubs and cruise ships right up until uh, March of this year. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So you, did, did you have any warning about George or did it just happen? Did he, did he talk to you in those, in that last year or so? No, like I said, he was kind of to himself and he was not himself anymore. He wasn't the George that I knew and loved, you know, the fun, just great to be around George. He was just moody and, and he snapped at people, which I'd never seen him do before, you know? Um, and, um, and we all, we all kind of figured, that's why I started booking other things because I said, I better start, I better stop depending on this. This is not gonna, I could just tell this is not gonna go on. He had talked also about not wanting to do this anymore. He was tired of doing comedy. This was, the, this was in the last year of his life. He was going, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna retire, you know? So, you know, I mean, we figured, okay, he's battling health problems. He's thinking about retiring. Um, and it was getting worse and worse. And then he got back, he was feeling a little bit better uh, the last couple of months of his life. And he was doing some shows in Vegas and, uh, and um, but still it was on the back of my mind. He was starting, oh, here's another thing that happened too. Uh, Live Nation was starting to take over his bookings because um, they needed, to, he was starting to not fill the theaters anymore, I guess, because his shows were getting dark. You know, some people were going, oh my, he's, I like what he's talking about me more and it's, it's kind of like depressing, you know, so he wasn't doing as well at the box office. So they had a, they had to let me go after 18 years because Live Nation, Nation said, we will promote your shows, but you have to use some of the opening acts that we have in our roster. So, so I, <laughs> once again, uh oh, <laughs> you know, so that happened and they started hiring me for the Vegas gigs. Uh, a little bit later, but I could just see the writing on the wall, you know, it just didn't uh, seem like it was going to continue anymore. It was a great run, 18 years. And then like, I got a call, we were coming back from a relative's wedding and we got a call from uh, a limo driver named Ira, Ira, who was George's uh, driver in New York. And we'd become friends. And he said, uh, George went to the hospital, he died today. So that, you know, and, and when I got the news, it wasn't like, what? You know, it was like, oh, crap, you know? I mean, I felt terrible, but I wasn't totally surprised because I knew, I kind of sensed that this was going to happen. Something bad was going to happen. Either he was going to retire or he was just going to get worse and worse health-wise. So that's what happened. Well, I appreciate the time to explain that. I really do. And now I want to hear much more about your writing. I mean, you're so multi-talented. You're not just a, you're not, not just a, a singer, song writer, a comedian writer of, of screenplays, you're more than that. I, I wanna hear what else you can do. Well, let's see. Well, like I said, I started as a songwriter and a musician. So uh, I never really stopped writing songs just cause I love it. And I think I'm pretty good at it. Uh, I was kind of, it's funny comedy to me. I always wrote on stage 50%, you know, interacting with an audience, but music was something that, songs was something I could write and sit down at a desk and actually come up with something that I thought was worthwhile. Um, so I, I won this contest in the 1970s for songwriting. I was like the number one uh, top 40 category. So that was always there. I never gave that up, even though I was doing comedy. And then when things started going this way where I'm doing less of it, um, I started, um, I, I reunited with my uh, old songwriting partner from from grammar school, oddly enough, and then high school and college. And um, and we started writing songs together again. Out of the blue, he sent me lyrics and I said, let me write the music for it. And he found a studio in Nashville. Uh, we started going to Nashville once a year, recording songs with the musicians there. Uh, and then we put out, uh, I put out uh, two albums. 
uh, one, one a jazz album, oddly enough, that I did here in Vegas, and the other uh, with the songs we did in Nashville. I just put out another one, uh, and I'm gonna I was gonna put out a third, but then the COVID hit, so I can't go to Nashville for a while. But I have enough to record another album. So there's that. And then I wrote the book, which is uh, all about my experiences opening for tons of different people. And it just came out on Monday. And I wrote that over the course of, I started writing it in 2010 and just kept updating it. And I finally found a publisher and now it's available online. And it's called uh, Touring with Legends. It's about Rodney and George and Joan and Tom Jones, who I worked with for a year, <laughs> toured with for a year. And then other people I, I opened for, the Righteous Brothers and the Beach Boys. And it's all these stories about all these people that I hung out with, you know, so, uh, so there's the book. So I just, I like writing, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to do, especially songs, but also comedy and, and uh, still writing for my act and doing that sort of thing. I just need to keep busy. I'm one of those guys can't just sit down for very long. That's great. That's <laughs> super, man. Hey, Dennis, that was just great. I really appreciate you being on the show and spending time with me. Hey, Bruce, thanks a lot. Thanks for letting me do this. And this was fun. And thanks for letting me uh, tell my stories. And uh, I hope uh, I hope it was interesting for the folks out there. Thank you so much. That's it for today, folks. The 80s Golden Age of Comedy. Check out the website, the 80s Golden Age of Comedy.com. And we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care now.